Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, first session of the European SDG Summit. We have the privilege to be the first session of uh, 30, a very rich session, which will happen during the whole week and four uh, plenary sessions, including one uh, today at 11.30 with Mr. Timmermans. Uh, we are uh, uh, starting this session and this summit with the State of the Union on Sustainable Industry, basically looking at uh, how we can develop more power uh, uh, through collective action, uh, how we can also, and the sectors and the industry federation can take leadership role into uh, moving uh, further and faster the sustainability topics. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the speakers, of course, and welcome all the attendees. Uh, thank you for being with us. A good way to start Monday morning, as it was just said between us. Uh, we have a rich agenda, but before going to the agenda, just a, a quick uh, uh, look at uh, a number of technical information. Uh, so uh, first, uh, make the full use of the uh, uh, session. Uh, so we have the possibility to have a live uh, discussion. You can normally the slides will move so you will uh, be able to see. Um, so uh, there are some elements so you can go to the chat and interact with other attendees. Uh, you can also uh, uh, go to the uh, question uh, to ask to the speakers. Uh, and uh, also there is a possibility to do some networking uh, so uh, to connect with the speakers on one side and to connect with the attendees. Uh, I'd just like to also uh, uh, invite you to go to the CSR toolbox where you can see uh, the uh, different services and support that uh, CSR Europe can give to companies, to industry federations. Uh, and uh, you can basically look there away who are the contact person for uh, the different uh, services. Just to set the scene. Uh, so we are, I'm sorry, but the slides are just trying to move. No, so that's all right. Uh, but anyway, to introduce this uh, session, uh, we are now in a very uh, uh, a strong environment where you have, of course, uh, everybody knows about the regulations which are in for the Green Deal and for all the different elements uh, on sustainability and ESG topics, and also a lot of pressure from the society. Just yesterday, there was a big demonstration in Brussels, as you know, uh, a lot of people uh, in the city. And in fact, uh, we are going to explore today how Basically, in order to go faster, to have a stronger impact, the collaboration can really support the uh, European agenda in terms of sustainability. We have a, a very uh, rich uh, uh, agenda, so uh, a lot of uh, very uh, good speakers on the topic. Uh, after my quick introduction, uh, uh, we will have the pleasure to have uh, Christine Meyer from uh, Eurostat explaining about the progress of the SDGs in uh, Europe. Uh, then Kirian uh, William Biari from Vigio Iris will give the first uh, explanation about uh, the barometer, the European Sustainability uh, Barometer, which has just been developed between CSI Europe and uh, Vigio Iris. And you will have the first insight of this barometer uh, on uh, the state of industry federation and sectors in Europe. Uh, and then we will have the uh, intervention from Deborah Revoltella from the European Invest Investment Bank to uh, explain about their uh, analysis of the uh, status of firms and municipalities on climate. We will then move to a panel discussion with five industry federations which are part of the Pact for Sustainable Industry. Uh, we will have Iris van der Weken from uh, Responsible Jewelry Council, uh, Walter Locks from uh, the European Fruit and Juice Association, Annie Carpentier from AS Beverage Carton, Susanna McLaren from Cobalt Institute, and Sandro Starita from European Aluminium. We will discuss together what uh, industry federation are doing and will do or should do uh, in terms of leadership for uh, sustainability topics in their sector. Uh, I will give the word after to Nirmalia, uh, Nirmalia Banerjee from Tata Consulting Services, who will also 
confirm uh, their opinion from their side about the necessity to collaborate in terms of uh, sustainability topics and also how digitalization can support and enhance the collaboration and uh, moving forward on this uh, area. And then the final presentation and explanation will come from Ulla Engelman from the European Commission, DG Growth, and basically reinforcing uh, how important it is to have strategic roadmaps and good coordination to enhance and support the transition pathways for industrial ecosystems. So a lot of interesting interventions today. And I would like to uh, start directly with uh, Christine Meyer, team leader of Sustainable uh, Development Indicators. Christine will tell us more about uh, what came out of the 2021 report on the progress uh, of uh, uh, these DGs in the EU context. And Christine, I give you the word. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and the honor to open this, uh, this conference. Um, so Eurostat, just as an introduction, we are part of the European Commission and we prepare annually a monitoring report on the progress of the EU towards the SDGs in an EU context. So we are not analyzing it according to the UN indicators, but we have selected indicators which are more relevant for the EU, which are linked to the EU strategies. So, yes, yeah, so on, uh, now you can see, so we have selected 102 different indicators, which are evenly distributed uh, across the 17 SDGs. Um, 37 of them are multipurpose indicators, so we use them to, uh, to evaluate more than one goal. Um, 90 indicators are updated annually. Then around two thirds of the indicators come from the European statistical system. Uh, which means these are all the statistical institutes in the EU member states, which then deliver their uh, data to Eurostat and, and we make an EU aggregate. Uh, and 39 come from non-ESS sources. So this means from mostly from the European Environment Agency, but then also other institutions like Transparency International. So where the statistical system doesn't really have data, we use other sources. And uh, two thirds of our indicators are also aligned with the UN SDG indicators. So you might know they have my, much more, they have uh, 237 indicators but some of them we, we wanted to focus a bit more. So we se selected six for each goal. And on the next slide, I give you just a very quick introduction to our assessment methodology. So what we do is if, if there is a policy target, for example, now the, the climate uh, target where we want to reduce by minus, or we want to reduce by 55% uh, the CO2 emissions, so the, then we take the, this target and we look over the last five years, what was the evolution and are we on track to reach the target? And if there is no quantitative target, we look at the trend. So are we moving in the, in the right direction or in the wrong direction and with how fast? And then we, so we have uh, between six and 12 indicators for each goal. We aggregate those and then we come to a goal assessment. So for each of the SDGs, we, we have a, an assessment uh, of how the EU is doing overall. On the next slide, you can see the, the results for the last five years. So what we published in 2021, our report. And so you see that the, the best performance we can see in, in SDG 16 uh, around peace, justice and strong institutions. And then also very good progress in SDG 1, no poverty, and SDG 3, good health and well-being. And I mean, knowing or I mean, uh, well, we are still in the in the pandemic, um, so this might be surprising, but we have to say that for SDG 1 and SDG 3, we have mainly data until 2019. So therefore, uh, the pandemic is not yet reflected and therefore, obviously, it's also going quite well. Um, so this picture might look completely different next year, I think. And then we have many indicators where or many goals where we have moderate progress. And I will present a bit in more detail because they are probably more relevant for you. And then some we have even, um, we go away from the goals. 
So for example, in SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, also SDG 15, life on land. On the next slide, you can see some uh, key results for 2021. And as I said, I've chosen those which are closer to your topics. Uh, so for example, SDG 8, uh, de decent work and economic growth. So we had obviously a substantial drop in GDP per capita in 2020. We saw a decrease in investment and employment, but the situation was still better than five years earlier. As I explained before, we have our evaluation methodology looks at the most recent data and the data five years ago. And because then we were still recovering, let's say, from the financial crisis. Uh, so even despite this uh, difficult year in 2020, it was better than five years earlier. Um, obviously, there was also a lot of uh, we have, uh, support from, from the governments. So this might also change then next year. Um, then SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. And there we also have the, the assessment is mainly up to 2019. And we saw a relative decoupling for both energy and material use. So that's when we compare it to GDP. So it was uh, growing slower than GDP. Um, we had also a growth in total waste generation. But on the other hand, we saw also that we recycled more and we recovered more waste. Um, SDG 9, industry, innovation and infrastructure, there's also moderate progress. I mean, some, some indicators uh, improved. So for example, R&D intensity continues to grow, to grow very slowly, but there it's, it's uh, improving. And air emission intensity of industry improved. So there we compare the emissions of PM 2.5 with the added value of uh, industry. And uh, we had, on the other hand, we, we still see that uh, environmentally unfriendly transport modes like uh, road transport, but also cars for passenger transport are still the main part of, uh, of the mobility. So this is not really improving, unfortunately. And I think we need a big effort there in order to reach the goals. On the next slide, you can see those uh, those goals where we made basically no progress or we moved even away from, from, the, uh, uh, from the objectives. So for example, in SDG 13, uh, the net greenhouse gas emissions went down, but we still need more progress to reach the, this goal of minus 55% by 2030. And we see that the impacts of climate change keep intensifying. So the European surface temperature is going up, ocean acidity is going up. So we still have to do more in order to, to become sustainable, sustainable. Then also SDG 15, life on land, we see that protected areas, Natura 2000 areas or forest area are increasing. But on the other hand, well, the bird index is also improving. So that's an indicator for biodiversity. On the other hand, the butterfly index deteriorated significantly. So maybe we also see there some positive aspects of the pandemic in the future years, but we, well, it, we will have to see. And then where we really see not enough progress is SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, because we also have quite ambitious targets there. So we want to increase energy efficiency by 32.5%. And well, the share of renewable energy is also, we have a target there and we have to do more in order to reach these targets. Uh, so yeah, these are the main results. Then I will just quickly show you in the next slide uh, what we had included, but I, I will not present in detail. So we had a chapter on, on the impact of COVID-19. So we showed some sh short-term data there. Uh, we also analyzed spillover effects and, as I said, decoupling. Uh, just a quick word on, on the spillover effects. You can see on the next slide, we had two different methodologies to to evaluate them. So we have on the one hand, we have footprint indicators in Eurostat. And next slide, please. And uh, But on the other hand, we also used multi-regional input output tables to compare. And on the next slide, you can see, for example, we calculate the material footprint, uh, which is 
on the next slide, please. Uh, you can see the import and exports in ton per capita. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I've probably the, the slides will be available later. So we import 7.8 tons per capita every year and our exports uh, generate or are equivalent to 5.3 tons per capita. So we import more material than we export. You can also see the, the different sectors. And just this final uh, slide, and the next slide you can see also, obviously, I mean, our exports and imports also generate jobs. So imports generate 60.9 million jobs and exports. Uh, so we, ex we import more jobs, let's say, I mean, the, the imports we make, they generate more jobs than our exports. On the other hand, also for CO2 emissions, and there I just wanted to, to show uh, Depending on the, on the methodology you use, you get very different results. So that's what we have to improve in the future to work more on this in order to establish also spillovers. So what are really the impacts of European uh, production and consumption and on a global scale? On the last slide, you can see just all the products where you can get all this information uh, with all the links to our website. So if you want to explore more, I, I invite you to, to research our website and then I will, uh, would like to thank you for your attention and give back to Michelle. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christine. Indeed, I'm sorry for having only 10 minutes for you to be able to present all this very interesting information, but I guess uh, uh, many of the people can go to your report and to the links and, and then uh, uh, get all the information. Anyway, very interesting and, and basically looking at the fact that uh, there is much progress to, to be done uh, for many of the SDGs and, and uh, many of them are just only progressing a little bit and basically climate definitely is one. But I also uh, uh, saw that one of the SDGs, which is the number 17, collaboration for the goals, is also progressing very slowly. And that's maybe the reason why we need such kind of session like today to reinforce the fact to collaborate together to go faster and to and and to get a, to have a stronger uh, let's say impact on the progress for the different uh, topics. Um, but thank you very much, Christine. And I would like uh, then to uh, uh, directly go to um, to Kirian uh, William Beari, Executive Director of VGO Aris. Um, as you uh, maybe some of you knows, we have launched last year the Pack for Sustainable Industry, um, and uh, so it was launched at the SDG Summit in 2020 last year. And we have launched also together in co collaboration between VGO Aris and CSI Europe the Sustainable Industry Barometer which is uh, uh, basically aiming at uh, uh, assessing the maturity and integration of ESG factors in the industry on the different sectors and also looking at uh, the level of maturity uh, of uh, the industry federation. And Kirian is going to give the first, uh, the first release of the information from the barometer, which is just basically launched now at this session. Kirian, uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, what came out from the barometer. Sure thing. Thanks very much and good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be with you all and to be able to showcase some of the data, the results and the insights from the 2021 barometer. Um, if we can skip forward to the next slide already, before getting uh, deep into the content, just a quick uh, remark on how this has come together. It's been the result of a fantastic partnership between uh, VE, part of Moody's ESG Solutions and CSR Europe. It's been the result of nine months of work, of interviews with 10 industry federations and the analysis of dozens of underlying ESG data sets from, from VE. At its heart, our 2021 barometer really looks to provide some metrics driven context to try and answer a fundamental question. How is European industry positioned today to tackle some of the sustainability challenges that it faces? We believe that the dual lens approach of analyzing both the actions of industry federations as well as the industries themselves really provides somewhat of a unique research perspective that fits quite well into this uh, first panel of the day on appropriately entitled the State of the Union on Sustainable Industry. If we can skip to the next slide, 
um, I just want to start walking through some of the lenses of analysis that we provide in the barometer. So one of the ways in which we've sought to provide that kind of metric-driven context has been through the analysis of ESG controversies impacting companies. And you can see our, our 2021 barometer, it's covering these kinds of events across the themes of climate, biodiversity, executive remuneration. But on this slide, I provided the metrics for social risks, effectively co companies being impacted by different kinds of social controversies. And you can see that already back in 2015, there was quite a high latent volume of these. But following the pandemic, we see a very clear spike. And the figures you have for 2021 are only figures up until May of, of this year. And so I think it reflects an element that we are already aware of, um, certainly for those of us who work in this uh, ESG field, namely that social risk is very real and very prominent for European companies and global companies. But the message I think for, for, for industry and industry leaders is clear. These risks are on the rise um, and the kind of social risks that we're picking up really cut across a whole range of uh, corporate activities from human rights interactions to supply chains uh, and then the workforce as well, uh, health and safety, stress at work, uh, racial and other forms of inequalities. If we jump to the next slide, um, here we show a different lens through which we've been analysing uh, the state of progress, if you like, or the state of the art within Europe. So this is our analysis effectively of energy transition. And today VE researches thousands of global companies around their policies, their commitments, their emissions trends related to the energy transition. But for the barometer, obviously we took a subset of that data very much focused on European sectors. And you've got 10 presented here today. In green, you can see the effectively the leaders across each of those sectors. And I think the encouraging news here is that regardless of which sectors we look at, the 10 here or the many others that we analyze, we can find very clear champions, uh, companies that have set either net zero targets that are aligned with the 2050 time horizon of the Green Deal, or in some cases in advance of that. In gray, you see the sector average performance, but the real area of analytical concern or the point of attention are the elements that you see towards the bottom of the graph in red there. So effectively, you see the weakest performers in each of the sectors that we analyze. Now, bearing in mind that VE's analysis of, of European corporates today is focused on mid and large cap companies, really what this tells us is that there are still a large number of, of big players who are effectively failing to disclose to their stakeholders, to their shareholders, and to the wider market how they're looking to tackle energy transition challenges today. The fragmentation that we see between the leaders at the top and the laggards at the bottom is a central piece of concern and a, a takeaway from our research piece. Champions are to be welcomed. Uh, the isolated pockets of excellence that we find are fantastic, but they will not be sufficient in order to drive Europe towards its SDG targets uh, and the targets of the European Green Deal. And so certainly one of the takeaways that I'll come back to later on is that really this is a call to action for, for industry federations to help to drive up the underlying level of performance, to provide more training, more education, and to try and bring a more cohesive approach to the energy transition across Europe. Moving forward to the next slide, um, this has obviously been a year in Europe marked by floods and wildfires, um, the physical risks of impact change so often talked about as a real theoretical concept, they're very much materializing in a very real way for European stakeholders and business. And apologies, I've got a fire alarm that's set off behind me, but I'm sure it's just a test. So we analyze one and a half thousand European companies on their approach to preparing for uh, and setting out plans to tackle the physical risks of climate change. And what we found is over 50% of those today provide no information, again, to their shareholders, to their stakeholders about how they are preparing their business to manage not the risks of tomorrow, but effectively what are the risks of today. Again, individual centers of excellent, fantastic uh, companies that appear very prepared for this, typically from the, the energy and extractive sectors were identified, but looking at Europe as a whole, that same line remains. Those individual leaders will not be enough to drive up preparedness and risk management for European industry as a whole. Moving on to the next slide, 
another one of our lenses was effectively around the SDGs. Now, here we actually looked at elements at the global level, not European level, through two distinct lenses. We looked at the products and services that companies are developing that can contribute to the individual SDGs, as well as the way in which they manage their business, their corporate conduct, and understanding to what extent it's aligned with the goals of the, of the UN. Now, this research has gone into in much more depth in the study itself, but effectively the key takeaways of this, progress certainly appears uneven, uh, and our general feeling, certainly within the research house, is that this is not necessarily an indication that we're on track. There are some areas of clear concern, particularly around SDG2, around zero hunger, where we find a limited amount of, of activity, even amongst companies involved in food and supermarket and beverage sectors around supporting this goal. At the same time, our, our message is, is quite clear that around the SDGs, there's certainly a huge amount of scope for, for innovation and investment to drive progress in the rest of the decade ahead. Now, moving forward, um, a big component of the research that we provided was around industry federations. Uh, we reached out to many and we're very thankful to the 10 industry federations that provided time to walk through the interview process with them. We looked to understand five components of how they work, their approach to policy, to direction, to organization internally, the kinds of activities that they were undertaking, as well as their approach to communication. And a very high level summary of our findings can be seen on this slide. At the top end, you see the percentage of interviewees that were actively involved in elements such as uh, EU consultations around sustainable policy initiatives, uh, the integration of sustainability into their governance, into their mission and vision statements. So there we found a very complete and very compelling response. But as we move further down, we found gaps and areas of concern or axes for improvement starting to emerge. The number of industry federations that had published publicly SDG roadmaps was somewhat patchy. The number of federations that had established time-bound targets that engage in impact-related activities, and also the number of federations providing annual reporting on their activities certainly begins to diminish amongst the panel that we looked at. The reactions amongst the industry federations were interesting to see. Some of them saw target setting as an unrealistic a role for them, others saw it as a, as a challenge, similarly when it came to the issue of impact. Some saw this as an element that was perhaps beyond their remit, others saw this as a, a challenge for them to embrace and to try and work towards. And throughout the barometer in the research piece itself, we've identified and provided examples of good and best practices that we were able to find through the interview process and through our additional research. Let me um, begin to close out my remarks by, by talking to some of the key findings of the barometer overall. So if we can skip to the, to the next slide. I think in our overall analysis of industry federations and of European industry in general, it's clear that strong foundations for working on sustainability and ESG issues are there. The integration into governance and into policy levels and into the organization of how bodies are working appears firm. But when looking beyond activities around awareness raising and training towards impact, um, the picture becomes less clear. When the European Commission launched its Sustainable Finance Action Plan, it talked about it as a plan to transform um, the financial sector in Europe. And I think that spirit or that mindset of transformation is certainly one of our calls to action. If industry federations are to drive and to play a bigger role than they do today in achieving the lofty goals that Europe has, a transformative mindset that is much more focused on targets, uh, on engagement and impact is likely necessary. On climate action, as mentioned before, it's clear that there are activities underway. It's clear that we have individual champions, but what we have is a very fragmented, fragmented approach. A mindset of, again, of transformation is, is likely necessary in order to raise the level of performance across the different companies and sectors that we analyze. And finally, on the SDGs within the E's corporate research, but also within our analysis of how the SDGs are integrated into the work of industry federations, we struggle to find a real strategic approach. And obviously, with less than a decade left to run on the goals, this is a, an area of concern. 
So let me conclude by saying, uh, I hope that these insights into the barometer have been interesting and insightful. I encourage you all to pick up the report uh, and to throw questions both to the team at CSI Europe and myself. We've tried to structure the report so that in the years ahead, we can continue to build on these metrics and measure them year on year, but also refine and adapt and increase the scope of this over time. I said in my uh, introductory remarks that the fundamental question we were trying to answer was what do things look like today and I think the simple one word answer would be fragmented that doesn't mean that there aren't grounds for optimism but it does show the direction in which we need to work so let me close again by by thanking CSI Europe for the fantastic partnership throughout producing this research piece and for everyone else I wish you all an inspiring uh, engaging and action-driven uh, next four days of conference thank you very much Great, Kirian. Thank, thank you also for your presentation. Thank you also from CSI Europe to the good and great partnership for, for this barometer. I think that's a really, really uh, inspiring uh, report that you have uh, now. And that should be uh, the foundation for moving forward for the Industry Federation. And I think that's a really good introduction to our panel discussion a bit later. Uh, and basically, uh, out of your uh, first uh, topics that you can take out of the barometer is basically the the the, the difference and the gap between uh, leaders and and laggers, and where we can see, of course, uh, the importance uh, for uh, the different businesses, uh, the leading uh, businesses and companies to bring the others uh, together with them and the responsibility they have also to share and to bring uh, uh, other companies together with them and also the industry federation to make this role of connecting the leaders with the laggers uh, i think very important and uh, definitely uh, important also to your your slide on the industry federation to see that uh, there is a uh, hundred percent of the federation which are basically having sustainability in the mission and uh, and uh, on the highest level. But basically, when it comes to action, there is more to do, and uh, and and definitely very good uh, to to have that as a as a starting point for discussion later uh, in the panel. And thanks again for the collaboration, Karen. Uh, I'd like now to move to move uh, forward to uh, uh, Deborah Revoltola from. Uh, European uh, Investment Bank. Uh, uh, Deborah is a Chief Economist and Director of, of the Economics Department. She will tell us more about uh, uh, basically the assessment from the uh, European Investment Bank on uh, firms and municipalities' uh, status uh, on climate change and uh, how they are uh, basically uh, now standing versus the ambition for 2050. Uh, Deborah, thank you for being with us and I give you the word, thank you. Thank you very much and uh, it's uh, really an honor uh, to come and I enjoyed very much the previous presentation uh, that I think uh, brings uh, a lot of element in common uh, with uh, what I will uh, going to speak uh, to tell you now. And uh, what I will focus is really a couple of questions. So, so how are EU firms, are EU firms uh, climate ready? And what is motivating them to recognize and address climate change risk, be it the physical on tra or transition risk? And actually, in the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, what I will do is uh, shed some light on uh, EU firms' self-assessment of these issues and I will present the results of a unique survey that we run on an annual basis at the European Investment Bank, and which interviews us on 12,000 firms at the EU level with the US as a benchmark. And I think I have some slide that you are showing if you go to the next slide. I think the key message that I will pass is actually that the puzzle is getting shape and the EU transition is coming, the, the climate transition is coming, um, it's becoming a binding reality for EU firms. Still, what we see is that the firms remain more proactive 
in trying to signal their positive stories, more, more on the ESG side, while they are only gradually, they are starting to recognize and address the exposure to risk, if you want the negative side of the story. And to encourage them to do more, I think there is one very important policy element that is that we need to have a very clear policy guidelines on where the policy direction is going in terms of, of uh, climate change. If uh, we get to the next slide, I, I think the, the, at the EU level, what we see is uh, um, this, uh, this uh, puzzle that is getting shape. So on the one side, uh, you can associate, if you look from uh, the right, uh, uh, right top, define and regulate allowed activities, a taxonomy, and they do not do additional harm a principle, are really clarifying the element of defining and regulating. But then there is the second element that is disclosure, disclosure exposure of counterparts. And here we see at the European level all the work done on companies disclosure since 2014, the 2018, and then the new requirement, extended the requirement for 2022, but also the um, reporting from the financial sector, which is quite important in terms of the CRR, the ECB supervisory expectation, but also the financial, uh, the sustainable finance disclosure requirement for market participants. And all of these is define the activities, ask the reporting side for companies, but also the financial market. The third element of the puzzle is associated to the pricing of risk, how much this is get priced in. And here what we see the evidence is very much that ESG, the positive news is clearly priced in the exposure to risk starts to be priced in, but it's not fully there. And the reason why it's not fully there is that the realization of what this exposure to risk means for companies and for the financial sector is still a work in process. And then the last element of the puzzle is accelerating and facilitating the investment going forward and compensating losers. If we go to the next slides, um, if we go to the next one, I will jump this, uh, this already. Um, the, what we ask in our survey is really to firms to look at uh, two risks. So their exposure to physical risk, the acute and chronic component. And then if we go to the next slide, and then the transition risk. Which, uh, which uh, depends on required change in the economy to adapt to the 2050 net zero emission commitment. And this is a, um, an element that, uh, uh, that is uh, related to how much the economy has to transform, and then also the timing and the commitment and the plans for this transition. If we go, go to the next slide, I start presenting some of the results of our work. So the first element is the perception of physical risk. So we look at the European firms, 58% perceive physical risk as a reality. In the US, the same share is some 52%. And what is interesting is you see very much country differentiation, but also at the regional level, what you see is that the firms that are located in regions which are more sensitive to physical risk, they are actually more aware and they are more likely to perceive it. So it means that the firms really know what they are talking about. If we go to the next slide, that's the asking two firms about the transition risk. So the transition to a net zero economy, what risk does it pose to firms? We ask the question, asking firms what they perceive it will mean in terms of demand for their product, their own supply chain, and your reputation. It's a more complex question, but here also the, the answer shows that the firms really react and respond in a different way. Overall, what you see is a lot of gray in this graph. The gray means 
No, it doesn't have an impact, but uh, we also have a, a strong perception. It means uh, that the firms uh, don't know about it. They don't know what uh, the effect is. And you have, uh, as I was saying, a lot of gray, a lot of uh, lack of perception of what, of what uh, this uh, transition to a net zero economy will mean for the firms. But then if uh, we distinguish uh, um, firms, uh, you see somehow that uh, those are that are in the low carbon sectors, they seem to see some more positive if they are aware of it. And those that are in the brown sector, and particularly in supply chain, they try to see more negative effect related to the net, um, net zero economy transition. But here, I, I, again, I think the important element is distinguishing this don't know and a lot of positive, particularly on the reputational point of view. If we go to the next slide, we distinguish firms according to size. Um, I think it's the, pre, um, the previous one. Um, in a, oh, uh, uh, never mind. In terms of size, what we had was that um, firms that are between large and small firms in terms of physical risk, there is no much difference in terms of perception. But what we see is that there is a difference in terms of a perception of a transition risk. And there are larger firms that tend to be more aware and also more on the positive side. They tend to run the transition more with a positive overview. In this slide, what we should see is the share of firms that are actually investing to address climate change. And here we see 45% at the European level and 32% at the EU level. So much stronger propensity to invest to deal with the physical and transition risk in the EU. And that's much stronger for a larger firm compared to um, smaller firms. If we go to the next slide, the other element that, um, that I'm trying to put in the picture is, uh, is uh, an inter interesting analysis in which we try to relate uh, the perception of firms uh, of physical and transition risk and uh, their uh, propensity to invest. What you see is uh, that the firms uh, that perceive a positive, uh, ele positive dimension related to the transition risk are the ones more likely to invest. So they run the positive story and they try to anticipate and get the gain out of it. The second ones are those uh, that uh, realize that there is a transition risk, see it negatively and invest to compensate to it. Those that are really not investing are those that do not assess properly what the transition will lead to them. If we look at physical risk, it's normal those that see an impact of physical risk, they invest in order to address it. So there is, in terms of investment strategies of firms, there is a this push of running the positive story first and then addressing the negative story. If we go to the next slide, um, here I think we, we try to show also that, that managerial practice matter and firms, particularly large ones that have a much stronger managerial practice, they also tend to be the ones and that's uh, shown, uh, shown in our uh, uh, analysis uh, that uh, invest uh, more. If uh, we go to the next uh, slide, and uh, here uh, a very important element, impediments uh, to investment, and here we ask uh, to the firms uh, which are the main barrier to investment. The most important one, and that's uh, the one uh, driving uh, my policy message, is uncertainty about regulation and taxation. Other element also matter, but a clear direction in terms of the policy dimension um, and uh, moving uh, toward uh, the, um, the policy dimension and giving a certainty in terms of regulation and taxation is probably the most important driver for firms uh, to invest. I will just cut short and go to the very final slide in terms of conclusions. 
And I think that the, the, the main message that I wanted to give is that the puzzle is getting in shape and the firms are, the, the transition to a net zero economy is really becoming a binding constraint for firms. Then the question mark is how to enhance it. And I think the key element is providing certainty of the policy trajectory, then start moving from leveraging on the ESG positive factor to better recognition of the risk associated to the transition. And then uh, the importance of a green management practice for the firm's level that we think is an important determinant for firm's capacity to react. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Deborah. And can you move? And I think indeed, uh, as you said, uh, the different presentations are uh, totally in line with each other, you know, and uh, what we heard from uh, Eurostat, from Vigio Aris, and from you. And uh, I think uh, I think it's an element which is very important as well, and what's uh, raised already in a previous meeting last week, also with Industry Federation, about the need for certainty and support from the regulation point of view and from the investment point of view. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this with us, and I guess also people can refer to uh, the links to your website and all this to have more information on this. Thank, thanks a lot, and I will turn uh, quickly to the panel discussion. Uh, uh, now, so I think these three presentations have been really good to introduce uh, the discussion that we have with the industry federations. Uh, and uh, we have here around the table uh, five industry federation federations which are packed of uh, which are part of the Pact for Sustainable Industry. We have uh, Iris van der Weken, Executive Director of Responsible Jury Council. Walter Locke, Secretary General of the European Fruit and Juice Association. Annie Carpentier, Director General, Ace Beverage Carton. Susanna McLaren, Head of Responsible Sourcing and Sustainability at Cobalt Institute. And Sandro Starita, Director Environment, Health and Safety and Sustainability at European Aluminium. So nice to have you all around the table. Just to remind uh, all the attendees, we launched the Pact for Sustainable Industry uh, one year ago at the summit. And uh, now we have a number of industry federation, which is, and I think the pact is a really good opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer discussion, for learning and sharing, and for uh, not only looking at uh, sectorial collaboration, how basically industry federation can uh, take the leadership in their sector, but also uh, for cross-sectorial collaboration. And uh, we, I will come back to that, but for example, we have uh, industry federation like uh, the uh, European Food Juice Association and uh, Ace Beverage Carton, where you have uh, basically the content and, and, uh, and the packaging together, which can work together uh, basically uh, on some potential topics in the future. You know, that's the aim of the Pack for Sustainable Industries to bring uh, industry federation together and looking at what Kirian mentioned at the barometer, see how they can basically take a stronger role in their sector. And I will uh, turn directly to, to Iris. Uh, good morning, Iris. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for being also in the Pact for Sustainable Industry. And I'd like to just simply ask you your reaction to what you heard and to the barometer and, and to explain to us how you take uh, the, the leadership role in your sector and uh, what are also maybe the, the, the challenges that you see in order to go faster in your sector. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the CSR uh, team for uh, inviting us to the table. Just a quick snapshot for those of you that do not know who the Responsible Jury Council is. Of course, we were founded in 2005 as the Industry Association for the Global Jury and Watch Industry, and today we have 1,500 members in 71 countries. Europe is, of course, a very important market because of the jewelry brands, mostly Italy and France are within the top five of the membership. So let's go back to, to what I heard. Well, first of all, I think, you know, it's, it's nothing uh, new or what I, what I, it's very much what I expected because I agree with Kirian that indeed uh, that industry associations need to go faster and advance, uh, you know, advance also to really develop transformational impact. And that requires a whole industry to accelerate on efforts. 
And the fact is, I think just like other industries, that we have members uh, at different stages of maturity. And it's very important to get all those members uh, aligned and to bring them to, um, to the next level. I think what we also see is a big appetite for what I would call SDG accountability. So we have never received so many requests from members to understand you know, how they can align their business strategy with the SDG framework. And at the same time, we've also received a lot of questions on uh, the link between the SDG framework and the ESG framework. Because for some of the biggest companies or champion companies who have you know, a lot of people in their team as experts, they are already very uh, much working on this topic. Sometimes for smaller enterprises, it's much more difficult. So we also see that as a key role for our organization. So allow me, Michelle, to just quickly also go through the fact, okay, what has RJC been doing? And I think it's important that we started in 2019 with doing a deep dive with an SDG survey with our members. And we quickly realized that if we wanted as an industry to really drive collective impact, that we needed to do a materiality assessment, which we did for the industry. We looked then at you know, what are the priority SDGs, um, and that was mostly for us gender, climate, decent work, responsible production, consumption, peace, justice, and of course, partnerships for the goals. And then we took it a step further in the sense that we build a framework for multi-stakeholder consultation, which I invite you to look at, which is called the Roadmap to 2030 and Beyond. And the roadmap has been aligned to the 17 SDGs and it talks about the most impactful contributions that we as an industry can do. But then we saw, okay, if we want people to be able to implement this roadmap, we need people to understand. So we have invested a lot of capacity in training, in education, and at the same time, within the governance framework of the Responsible Jury Council, we have set up a specific task force, which is called the SDG Task Force, which is really responsible for moving this roadmap ahead. And I think it's interesting maybe that within that SDG task force, you've got you know, big brands like uh, Hermes and, and members from the Richemont Group and, and the Peers and Alrosa, but you've got very small players that are super meaningful <clears throat> to see how practical is this. We are now doing testing of metrics towards the SDGs in a pilot. And by the end of this year, we will show the results about the learning curve, what's going well, what are the challenges, what do we need to do to really deep dive? And then finally, going to the point of what Deborah was saying, we're linking it to the ESG framework. So we're working with Arabesque on metrics based on international uh, reporting frameworks. And we're also testing the waters there to understand better, you know, how can we help companies um, report on progress? And as a final comment, I guess, you know, what we see as the important role for us and as an industry association. I think one, it's helping our members uh, move ahead. You know, if we want to deliver 2030, we need to go faster and we need to help them with that. So education is critical. Second, we want to help them advance uh, to be fit for purpose with the regulation. How can we see that our code of practices is at all times fit for purpose? So when new regulations come in, the standard can help implement the regulations. Third, we want to be closer to the financial markets. We believe the only way forward to stay relevant as an industry association is that we need to demystify ESG performance and see that our members understand that this is the way business will be done and we need to help them report. And finally, we see that we have a huge opportunity in helping um, report on progress. So transparency reporting on the different stakeholders' uh, expectations. So again, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very much looking forward to working with all these industry associations. And again, also take the opportunity to learn from each other and do more benchmarking. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Iris. Uh, and good to hear all what you are already doing and how important you see the role of your federation for your members. Uh, I really like the fact that on one side you, uh, you interact with multiple stakeholders, which is definitely important to align with all the different stakeholders, but also you, you bring big and small companies together. And we could see from the previous presentation, basically, 
the one from EIB, and uh, uh, that uh, basically there were still big difference between big and small companies. I think this this is definitely important that the industry federation take that role to bring small companies also with the big ones. Uh, and and thank you, thanks a lot. And uh, I would like then to turn to uh, water uh, water locks from uh, uh, the food juice. Uh, uh, association and uh, hello, uh, Walter. Good morning, uh, and and good also to hear your reaction from the barometer and also what you are doing to what we discussed already before. Uh, basically, I think uh, you like to basically move ahead more and more uh, in your sector and take a stronger role. Uh, I think you have done a lot of activities already in education with your members, sharing and learning and, and giving them the possibilities to exchange, but you like to move ahead into more action. Can you tell us more about what you are doing? Thank you, Walter. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Michel, and thanks to uh, CSR Europe indeed to uh, invite us uh, and everything I wanted to say you have already said, uh, Michel, but uh, it's true. Uh, so we as AIGEN represent the European fruit juice industry. We always claim that we represent the interest of the fruit juice um, sector, which is uh, not 100% uh, correct because we only have bottlers in our um, uh, membership. And I'll come back to that because that will be one of the big aspects for us also. You indicated that we are in good uh, companionship, having uh, Anik uh, uh, on this round table, but also with Sandro because also fruit juices are bottled in cans, in aluminium mm -hmm. cans. As you mentioned, Michel, we are um, working already on sustainability for a very long time. Uh, and that's also where we uh, will uh, elaborate upon because that's uh, leading to some missing points and why, why we are now stepping in back again in a second sort of um, um, circle to get sustainability back again on our agenda. Uh, sustainability has always been on our agenda because we are an agricultural production. We were uh, at the foundation of a, the creation of a CSR, Juice CSR platform in 2013, funded by the European Commission. We also uh, coordinated uh, the uh, Juice Covenant in 2017 with the aim of having, uh, by 2030, 100% um, uh, sustainable sourcing of juices. Uh, but yet, we want to now start with a sustainable roadmap 2030. And why is this? As you have mentioned, Michel, everything has been on sharing best practices, sort of education, um, establishing a vision, but not a vision into practice. And, and now I come to uh, our uh, specificity of our sector. As I said, we only represent the bottling, meaning you can bottle juice, but if the juice is not coming from a sustainable growing agricultural production, then you can do whatever you like. You will not have a sustainable uh, juice. Further on, you can have a very sustainable juice bottling, but if your packaging is not sustainable, then also your juice doesn't become sustainable. So that's why uh, we really want to look um, into upstream and downstream when setting a uh, sustainable roadmap to uh, 2030. The biggest problem, of course, also is we are a very global uh, sector. 70% of the orange juice comes from Brazil. So needing... Uh, we need a lot of people uh, around the table to make a juice sustainable roadmap. Also, I think uh, Kieran made that remark also, leaders and, and the small uh, enterprises. Um, alone in Germany, we have 300 bottling companies. So and we have, of course, everybody knows the very big uh, global leaders, but uh, going to the European market, it's so diverse to get them all uh, alongside. And I think that's where our learning process is within CSR Europe, sitting together indeed also with um, Anik. And I'd have to thank Anik because she has already made her roadmap. So I can just copy and paste most likely of that uh, roadmap. But it, it, that's where we um, have our role is getting people together. The understanding has been done in our educational role with this uh, creation of the CSR, Juice CSR platform as well. But now we really need to get people uh, committed together to get them aligned, pre-competitive, um, with a sort of um, the red light stick saying legislation will be there. So the, as you mentioned, predictability of legislation is needed because it's going to be our guiding light saying there is legislation coming ahead of us. We need to act. If we don't act, then, of course, there will be financial repercussions. 
and you cannot do it alone as a company. There's so much, there's such a vast um, uh, uh, aspect of legislation coming to us, you can't do this alone. And as I said, there is a value chain. So even if you want to do the best bottling company uh, in the world, in your, uh, then if your juice is not sustainable, you will not be becoming a sustainable juice uh, sector. So that's our cooperation. That's what we try to aim now by starting our um, exercise and being part of this um, group of CSR, changing, uh, interchanging, as you say, exchanging best practices, uh, learning processes from all aspects and from all uh, leaders in this, uh, in this uh, CSR Europe. Thank you. Th th thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much, Walter. Thank you. And indeed, uh, that's the objective of the Pack for Sustainable Industry. And that uh, when you say copy paste, uh, maybe, but at least inspiring yourself from the different uh, already best practice from others and definitely from Annick and what she has done already in Ace Beverage Carton, but also from others. And uh, that's the objective. Huh? So no need to uh, work individually. Like you say, there are too many things to tackle. And I think uh, if we want to really tackle all these uh, objectives, uh, strong objectives that we have, uh, we need to collaborate. And thank you also for making the transition. So I will go to Anik directly. Uh, and Anik, maybe if you can really try to keep it to uh, four or five minutes maximum and to explain to us, uh, I'm sorry to put the pressure on the time, but we are on the, on the time pressure. Um, to explain, I think you have already your roadmap indeed, as Walter said, and I think you have very ambitious targets also with uh, being uh, climate positive uh, in your sector. I like very much what you said last week in another meeting about the fact that the federations are responsible to make it possible for businesses to take action. So maybe you can tell us a bit more uh, today. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to CSR Europe for inviting us today. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll build a little bit on what Water said. And indeed, uh, I think that the barometer confirms the importance of sustainability in the, in the company's agenda, but therefore as well in our association's agenda. And working together in a pre-competitive manner actually helps bringing companies towards achieving common goals. And one of the key and biggest challenge today, as we all know, is climate change. So that is clearly a focus for all of us. So we need this cross-fertilization across the value chain, and that is, actually, we already have a, a part of the value chain within our membership, since we have the suppliers of the board using beverage carton, we're mainly made from uh, renewable resources, but we do have also the converters of beverage cartons. And, and indeed, we look forward to uh, working across the value chain with indeed the Jews Association, maybe others as well, to make sure that together, and as we are inter interdependent, together we can really have a significant impact in improving the value chain uh, footprint as a whole. I said as well, we need enabling conditions, we need legislation to be predictable, to set targets, and to let industry innovate and get the time to innovate. Now, what have we done? I mean, today already beverage carton is a recyclable, low carbon packaging, but our members want to go further and not only to meet legislation required or legislative requirements, but really to also contribute to meeting societal challenges. And, and therefore, as mentioned in, in March 2021, uh, we have adopted the ACE 2030 roadmap, which sets a very ambitious vision for 2030 and beyond, as, as you said, Michel, uh, our industry wants to deliver the most sustainable packaging for Brazilian food supply systems, which is renewable, circular, and carbon positive. That's extremely ambitious. But we, we want to walk the talk. So we have also very ambitious commitments and that's by 2030. And I'll just name a few in, in, in view of time pressure. Uh, so one of them is that we will only produce beverage carbon from renewable and or recycled material. We will decarbonize the industry value chain by the 1.5 degree target, which is set by the Paris Agreement. And we will uh, have a target for collection, collection of beverage carton for recycling of 90% and a 70% recycling target. We, in 2007, our members already committed to full traceability of the fibers used to produce beverage carton, and, and that has been verified and achieved since 2015, but we now want also to have certifica certification of all the materials which are used in beverage carton. So we really want to have action from sourcing 
to end of life and have cross fertilization, as I said, uh, across the different uh, elements of the value chain. Now, one last word associations are good enablers to make it happen. But of course, behind that, you only have the companies. They do invest, they do innovate. And so their role is essential, but we're there to again bring them together. They do also work with their customers and suppliers, and all of that creates a, a system which is positive towards indeed uh, going for more sustainability. There's no doubt we need to take that path. And my final word will be about the just transition. Uh, at the moment, I, I don't know any or barely know any association that really works on, on the social aspect. It, it's complex, it's global, it has different elements, but maybe that may be our next challenge for the future years once we really are all on the same page on sustainability. So I will leave it there and thank you again. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Anik. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, it's good to hear also all the... Uh, proactiveness that you have taken and already also to set up a clear targets, which is also very important. Thanks a lot. Uh, on your um, last statement about the social aspect, I think it just showed the importance to have a number of industry federations around the table and to discuss together because you are more probably uh, more advanced in a few elements uh, linked to climate or to the environment. While, for example, Susanna at Cobalt Institute, in fact, has more uh, progress in the social aspect with uh, basically uh, the uh, due diligence and uh, basically the, the LCA exercise that has been done already in Cobalt Institute and basically also looking at the human right. And Susanna, maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. Also share your feedback from uh, from the barometer. And also, I think one uh, element that you mentioned also in the discussions we had previously is also uh, the, the role for industry federation also uh, looking at the members to recognize the role of industry federation to take leadership in sustainability. So basically uh, that the members see uh, a change in the historical uh, support from industry federation, from advocacy to also leadership in this kind of topic. So, Susanna, also, if you can keep it to four or five minutes, thank you. I think you are muted. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I've been on mute for so long, I forgot to unmute myself. But thank you. I think, um, yes, we, we go, um, the order of, of presentations is perfect, um, building on what, what Anik said. Um, and thanks uh, again for inviting us. I'd say that when the, the Cobalt Institute chose to join the pact, it was because we saw an opportunity to share a platform with like-minded industry associations who recognize their power, I'd say indeed their responsibility, to not only defend and promote the commodity they represent, but also to leverage collective action to achieve growth and prosperity for both people and planet. And this, this mandate indeed does push far beyond what I, I would say has been the traditional view of an industry association that exists solely to represent the interests of its constituents. For someone like me, a sustainability practitioner in this industry for over in the sector for over 20 years, um, it really empowers me to, to drive that change within our organization, to scale up action and become more impact oriented. And that would ultimately place us in a better position to achieve the ambitious goals set out in Agenda 2030. But I think it's important just to contextualize and say who we are as the Cobalt Institute. So we are a not-for-profit global trade association representing the cobalt industry. The cobalt industry. Um, we are dedicated to promoting the sustainable and responsible production and use of cobalt in all its forms. And I think our strength is indeed the fact that we represent an estimated 75% of the global cobalt market, as well as the whole value chain. So producers, users, recyclers and traders of cobalt. So that in itself provides a really unique opportunity to use our leverage for positive impact. And I'll say something about the metal cobalt and how it fits with the sustainability agenda. Because it's important, and in case um, our audience isn't aware, cobalt is a key component of most of the common types of lithium ion batteries that power electric vehicles and store energy from solar, wind and other renewable sources, thereby placing it front and center um, in the zero emissions agenda. And in future, cobalt may also be used as a catalyst for producing zero hy carbon hydrogen. And like other metals, cobalt is used but never consumed, hence it is infinitely recyclable, placing it 
really as an important metal in the circular economy agenda. So in itself, we have some really important sustainability attributes from, from the product itself. And cobalt demand is expected to increase threefold within the next decade to, up, to power the uptake of electric vehicles in Europe and globally. But what we see is that, or what we believe, is that significant challenges will emerge if the energy transition is not managed responsibly as well as inclusively. So our challenges are probably quite, quite unique in that we have a, a product that you know, contributes to um, you know, reducing emissions just by the product itself. But we, we have some, some interesting characteristics. So for instance, um, cobalt, uh, over 65% of global production comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And despite being endowed with exceptional nat natural resources, hydropower potential, significant arable land, and the world's second largest rainforest, the Congo has the third largest population of poor globally. And it's also important to note that refining capacity is relatively concentrated with China producing the majority of the world's refined cobalt, as well as being a hub for battery manufacturing. So I, I think I'm immediately painting a picture of where some of our challenges lie. And it's, it's because of those challenges, which really require us to, to produce um, cobalt strategically, that earlier this year, we launched a project to assess our strategic role in this agenda as the Cobalt Institute. I also want to add that a key driver for this project was to position the cobalt industry to meet the requirements of the EU mandatory due diligence legislation that's on the cards and which I understand will be a focus of day four of this summit. And for us, this progressive legislation, as well as the batteries legislation and the broader European Green Deal, provides an opportunity for the cobalt industry to demonstrate leadership in a sector that has been in the spotlight for a while, uh, frankly, due to its connection to severe human rights impacts, predominantly related to artisanal and small scale mining. So to be clear, we're not saying that ASM is, is, is inherently bad. We actually believe it makes up an important share of cobalt supply in the Congo. But we do also recognize it can be associated with hazardous working conditions, unfair trading practices, and in certain instances, child labor, which could really go against the, the SDG agenda. So our project mapped the value chain to build an under, the cobalt value chain to build an understanding of the full scope of ESG risks across all geographies and phases for all the uses of cobalt. So just to characterize that, we mapped extraction, trading, transportation, and warehousing, refining and smelting, manufacturing and end users, as well as recycling and disposal, because it's important to think about some of the impacts arising from that when we think about the circular economy. And our project was grounded in the UN um, guiding principles on business and human rights, on which the, form, uh, the forthcoming due diligence legislation is premised. We assess salience of risks. For those of you who are familiar with the concept, it's those impacts that rise to the top of the list because they are at risk of being um, having the most negative um, impacts through a company's activities or business relationships. And once we identified those high priority risks, we then considered where we as an institute are best placed to facilitate collective action to achieve meaningful outcomes. And in particular, focusing on areas which are of mutual interest to our members, currently not being adequately addressed, require engagement with other sectors, or were simply put, there were blind spots. We also took into account our existing involvement in other collaborative initiatives, such as the Global Battery Alliance, the Batteries Product Environmental Footprint, Drive Plus, and... Maybe, Susanna, if, if I may ask you to, if I may ask you, sorry, to interrupt you, to, to maybe conclude from the high level point of view, would be great to just give yes, of course. To Sandra. So, so in conclusion, this all this analysis that I presented really informed the development of our responsible sourcing strategy, which will be a key pillar of our broader sustainability roadmap, which is aligned with um, Agenda 2030. And that sustainability roadmap um, will, will, of course, look at decarbonization and circular economy. But for us, the, the key thing is we need to get the responsible ethical side right as well as, as the other elements. And, and that's where, where we will be focusing our efforts. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Apologies for interrupting you, but uh, in order That's to fine. give the time to Sandro. Great also to see what you are doing and basically your intention to continue to take uh, leadership and uh, in fact, more leadership in your sector. Uh, and I'll move directly to Sandro. Uh, Sandro, welcome and, and good morning. Thank, thank you very much also for being here with us. 
and uh, and and I'd like to hear also your reaction to the barometer and also what you are doing. I think you have a very uh, strong uh, sustainability roadmap also in European aluminium, and I let you uh, mention about it. Thanks a lot, Michel, and thank you for the invitation to CSI Europe and to the colleagues who spoke before me. Um, the the barometer, I think it's a it's a very good initiative. Of course, uh, whenever you can measure progress, then you you know where you are, and so you can also set targets and and, and monitor progress. It's clear that um, the, the setting. Uh, targets with, with with numbers has to be very very much adapted to the specific characteristics of a, of a sector. Uh, aluminium was not involved in the barometer, so I I can't rely to many of the results. But in other cases, it's important to to uh, assess a bit more in depth. And I think it was also very important what was mentioned by the colleague from Eurostat that presented some numbers that were the latest available are before the pandemic. The world changed completely, so sometimes the numbers can tell a story which needs to be interpreted as not just taken as such because it sometimes sectors can be very complex and therefore an average doesn't take into account the extremes that you can have on both sides but at the same time we started this european aluminium many years ago to collect indicators for sustainability so i mean we have been through these difficulties and we have assessed them in over time uh, i think that the the results of the barometer are very much meaningful in terms of saying that there is a good basis to start with, but then, of course, it has to be built up. And in that sense, the cooperation across sectors can be very useful. And um, just a couple of words about European aluminium. We represent the aluminium industry this year. Actually, this month we are celebrating the 40th, uh, 40th anniversary. So this, there's a lot of history of activities. And as I said, since about 20 years, we have started collecting and publishing sustainable indicators. So um, there is a commitment uh, from the sector since a long time. We launched a sustainability roadmap in 2015. I have presented it last year at the summit, uh, I mean, to, uh, to, give, to give it a contribution. And also together with CSI Europe a few years ago, we assessed the, the link between the roadmap and the SDGs. So no surprise there, there are a number of SDGs that are extremely relevant for a sector like ours, and especially the, the cooperation aspect. So the SDG 17 is, is crucial in this sense. In order to support our members to uh, to the implementation of the roadmap and also therefore to the link to the SDGs, we have in, uh, undertaken a number of initiatives which are, I think, relevant uh, with respect to the to the differences between the leaders and laggards that was mentioned before. So we have developed some guidelines using the expertise from the membership in order to help everyone to develop internal process processes to go into the um, implementation phase. For example, for the management of waste for the management of water so we are using the expertise from the from the from the leaders in order to have a common standard a common reference to build uh, management plans at, at all levels of the industry we also created um, an online platform to share uh, expertise and experience from the uh, accidents in the workplace and uh, new solutions for the prevention of accidents in the workplace and so this is also another way in which association can share best practices within the same sector and we also created an innovation hub where the uh, pro, uh, companies can, can work together towards innovation projects. And this is within our sector, but of course, what can be done with other sectors in terms of industrial symbiosis, in, term, in terms of uh, co-definition uh, of projects can be extremely important. It, in the previous presentation, it was highlighted how much produce is linked to the beverage cartons and the beverage cartons contain aluminium and uh, the in the case of uh, of cobalt, of course, it's a it's a metal that's mined. Of course, so this, there are similarities with also other mined metals that then can be recycled at the end of their life. So they have all the circularity aspects to take into account. So there are definitely some uh, some elements of a common discussion that can be can be done, and that's the reason why we we, we joined the, the Pact for Sustainable Industry. I think it's also important, something that was uh, highlighted in terms of uh, uh, context and legislative environment, also non-legislative environment that can help. Because for example, these days, uh, our sector, which is extremely energy intensive, is suffering a lot from the increase, uh, increase of the energy prices, which uh, peaked in the last few weeks. And this is something that can affect a lot all the programs towards the the sustainable target because you have a, a contingent problem that you need to solve in that sense you need also some visibility as was mentioned for the investments you need also to have a, a certainty of 
what is the context in which you can invest because those activities require a lot of investment it's also shortages of raw material that depends on um, kind of monopolies in other regions of the world and so we depend on the supply from from these situations so in that sense it's very important also to cooperate in a constructive way with the with the policy makers so that the efforts from the industry can be uh, can have enough visibility in order to to be performed in the best way because aluminium is uh, is a, a traded material global level with the price set at the london metals exchange so the margins on maneuver in the market are quite limited and so this is important to take into account and so i mean we look forward to to cooperating and participating with the other sectors we are happy to share our experience also our difficulties so that others can 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 possibly learn from the from the lessons that we also took from the experience so looking forward to that thanks a lot uh, sandro thank you very much indeed and uh, good to see also all what you are doing i think definitely uh, the elements of the fact that there is already a good basis and that you are ready to discuss with others is basically the, says it all so that's where that's the reason why we are here and basically this connection and this collaboration will definitely help i'm looking forward to the next uh, meeting with all the industry federation of the pact for sustainable industry and that we can ex uh, have more time basically to exchange and to go more into the actions and how to help each other and that's great and i would like to thank uh, all the five uh, speakers uh, Iris, Walter, Anik, Susanna, and uh, and Sandro, and I'd like to have a, a, a quick reaction also from uh, Nirmalia, Nirmalia Banerjee from uh, Tata Consulting Services. Nirmalia, you are going to tell us also how you see at Tata uh, Consulting Services the importance of collaboration and also how digitalization can uh, support this collaboration. Uh, if you can also keep it to four or five minutes, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Michel. Uh, very good morning, everybody. And thanks for joining this uh, forum, which will play a very pivotal role in accelerating the Europe's journey towards a sustainable future. Uh, many, many of the things which I'm going to talk about has already been discussed, so we are thinking alike. Uh, at DCS, we have the unique advantage of sitting at the cross-section of wide array of industries. This means we can put the technology to uh, work across ecosystems to enable collective journey towards climate neutrality over a sustainable future. The findings uh, in the sustainable industry barometer have been quite insightful and a reminder calling for more and faster actions. They reflect many of those challenges which we also see in the industry and also reflected in our own ESG evaluation crate. The findings reveal enormous fragmentation in the sustainability maturity within Europe and even within industry sectors with clear leaders and laggards which is also what we are seeing uh, very critical and which really substantiates the need for cross-industry collaboration. While industries can always make strides forward through innovation, uh, we believe many of the elements of this journey like circularity, biodiversity, social goods can only be achieved through cross-industry collaboration. This is evident as we see progress on zero hunger, quality education, life below water, life on land are below power. When you see rising amount of uh, ESG controversies in the industries that drive economic and energy transition, the holistic need for cross-industry collaboration becomes even more pronounced. Also, while industry federations from the material sector appear to outperform those from the consumer and retail focused sectors, a collaborative approach, which we just discussed, is going to increase uh, the adoption and the pace of the journey substantially. And how do we make this happen? As a partner in the purpose uh, growth at TCS, we believe it's our job to cut across the industry verticals and offer solutions that advance the entire ecosystem towards sustainable coexistence and concurrent growth. Today, it is great to see organizations across Europe adopting new business models, which involve collaboration by design. As we work with our clients to build circular ecosystems, we believe building the collaborative uh, collaboration at the core of it. At TCS, uh, giving an example, we are enabling an energy retailer realize its sustainability ambition by building a negative emissions community. Believe a negative emissions community, we are doing this by creating a multiplayer ecosystem across a variety of sectors who are joining hands towards a common goal. And that observation from the barometer survey is that there is lack of strategic coherent approach to sustainability. We believe technology, specifically digital and emerging technologies, can help 
identify a common baseline, establish concurrent targets, enable performance visibility, and foster cooperation between industries and sectors. Digital fabric would then be the unifying factors in cross-industry collaboration. That was the question that you're asking, Michelle. We believe it, it is going to be a great enabler. But what do you mean by this? While ecosystems and business models are now being designed for co-innovation in mind, a digital fabric will help embed the model, leveraging emerging technologies like, say, self-feeding materials, digital twin, quantum computing, and even a living AI. By this, we ensure inclusivity and collaboration remain as the two founding pillars of any business success. Giving an example, one of our partners in the chemical industry has embarked on a sustainable oil exploration and refinery with an innovative business model leveraging digital fabric. We're also enabling an agri-input provider to establish a disruptive carbon marketplace that will further incentivize carbon sequestration in the farm to fork value chain using digital fabric. So the need for collaboration towards sustainability and power of digital technologies to ignite that is conspicuous. We now need to act decisively together to create a new economic model built on sustainability and regeneration. Borrowing what's from Henry Ford, coming together is beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. Let's take our progress so far to a great success by working together. Always remembering, alone, each one of us can be a drop, but together we can be an ocean. Thank you. Look forward to collaborating and driving this journey together with all of you. Thanks. Back to you, Michelle. First, uh, unmute. So thanks a lot, Nirmalia. Thanks a lot uh, for this. Uh, uh, yes, uh, good uh, presentation about uh, the support of technology for uh, collaboration. We are looking forward also to work uh, with you. And I, I would like to uh, hand over quickly to the last presenter. So we are a bit be, uh, behind time, but Ula, thank you very much with, uh, to be with us, Ula Engelman. So head of industrial forums, alliance and clusters at DG Grow of the European Commission. And Ula, you are going to tell us how important it is to have uh, strategic roadmaps and, and good coordination to uh, support uh, the transition uh, the transition pathways in uh, industrial ecosystems. So thank you, and I give you the word, Ula. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, very uh, interesting to follow your discussions uh, today. And um, I would like uh, to, because you talked a lot about the uh, need for cooperation and bringing things together, while respecting, of course, also the social dimension. So um, that's why I think, and I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to make you aware of our transition pathways, which are part of the industrial strategy update, which was published in uh, May this year. And there you find this mention of transition pathways. And the transition pathways are really wanting to bring together the different elements uh, for uh, the twin transition, digital and greening, with a sustainable uh, chap not chapter, with a sustainable chapeau, uh, because that is what fosters resilience. So we think you cannot um, distinguish and uh, take out the resilience when you talk about the twin transition. And that's why for this transition pathways, we want to bring these different elements together. And we have chosen a twofold approach on the transition pathways. On one hand, we start with some of the ecosystems, and some of you have mentioned, for example, the energy intensive uh, industries as an ecosystem. So uh, we, have we have come up with scenarios which are now in public consultation for uh, transition pathways. And I would encourage all of you because the one, the scenarios for the transition pathways for energy intensive industries are out. They have been published uh, a week ago and they are open for public consultation for eight weeks. So this is now the moment to, to, to make your point and to contribute to this public consultation. Um, we will also soon publish uh, scenarios for uh, mobility. 
And uh, before the end of the year, we are also working on scenarios for the construction ecosystem, as well as proximity and social economy and textiles. So this is a work which is ongoing and which will be coming out for consultation uh, still this year. But in parallel, because we also have the industrial forum and the industrial forum is a body which we, uh, it has a form of an expert group where we bring together member states, uh, different industries, but also NGOs. And within this industrial forum, we are also working on the transition pathways, but in a more general way, in the sense that we are working on building blocks, what would be elements which are important for the different ecosystems? Because we also need to look into how can we by cross fertilization of the different ecosystems help and uh, strengthen uh, the transition pathways. But in order to make uh, this work of the industrial form as inclusive as possible, we have created a wiki. And on this wiki, you can contribute with your ideas or also with proposals for experts, because the industrial forum itself is set up as an expert group. So this is very limited, but our idea is really to go as broad as possible. And therefore we have also this wiki, which allows all of you to contribute and bring in your ideas. So these were the two main points which I wanted to, to raise awareness that on one hand, we have the industrial form with a wiki where you can contribute. And we have the specific scenarios which are going pub, which are to be published or which have been published as staff working documents. And therefore, you can also contribute during the public uh, consultation. I think I leave it like this as we are short of time, but there are concrete moments and it is now where you could really con contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ula. Thank you for making my life easier with the time. And then thank you very much for this good uh, complementary information comp and, and presentation with all what we heard before indeed. And, uh, and, and indeed, it's an opportunity for everybody to contribute, to give opinion, and to uh, be part of this consultation. Excellent. And, uh, and then I will go uh, now very quickly to uh, the conclusion. We finished the last presentation with this very rich and inspiring session of the first roundtable for the SDG Summit. Uh, so, in fact, uh, just uh, I'd like to reinforce the fact that uh, this uh, collaboration between industry federation is, uh, is, is an opportunity for the different industry federation to, to learn and share information between each other. Uh, we are inviting industry federation others to join, of course, and to uh, enlarge the group to continue to progress together. Uh, and uh, of course, you can contact uh, us at CSI Europe. You can contact also Kirian at Moody's for more information about the barometer. Uh, and in fact, uh, you will also learn during the, 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 the full week with a number of other sessions, uh, also a lot of collaboration between companies from different sectors, from uh, other industry federations as well. This afternoon, there is a session uh, with uh, different of our NPOs, uh, national partner organization, doing national pack for sustainable industries. So looking at the collaboration at national level. And I invite you really to register to all the sessions during the summit. There will be now in uh, less than 30 minutes, the first plenary session with Mr. Timmermans and different CEOs from companies like Ilham Kadri from Solvay and also the CEO of NL. Uh, and so I will just conclude with that. So to first thank all the speakers for really the great input uh, for each in a few minutes and, uh, and basically to reinforce this fact for collaboration in bringing also the people through the transition. So the social aspect is also very important. The fact that there is already a good basis, a number of good things are done, but still further progress into action is necessary and through collaboration, uh, that's probably the way to go in order to make sure that things can happen and all the ESG topics can progress in the correct way. And also the SDGs, as we have seen from the first presentation uh, of Eurostat mostly. 
Uh, thank you again, everybody. I'd like to thank also Alessandra and Georgia who made this session uh, uh, possible also for the preparation and for uh, all the technical support. And I wish you a very nice day and basically a very nice summit and hopefully to meet you in some other sessions. Thanks a lot to all and specifically to all speakers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.